Hello everyone. This is the third part of our lecture series on our first lesson in STS 10, the historical antecedents of science and technolo technology. In this video, we will be learning more about science and technology in the Middle Ages. Now, the millennium between the collapse of the Western Roman Empire in the 5th century CE and the beginning of the colonial expansion of Western Europe in the late 15th century has been known traditionally as the Middle Ages. And the first half of this period consists of the five centuries of what is called the Dark Ages. Now, by the way, I'd like to remind you that the notation BC or before Christ implies the same meaning with BCE or before the common era or before the current era. AD, which means Anno Domini, also denotes similar meaning with CE or the current era. In this lesson, I will be using AD since it's audibly distinct. So after the collapse of Rome, the center of science shifted to the east. And in this lecture, we will look into the contribution of the Arabs to science. And we will also see how the rise of Islam helped in the flourishing of Arab science. We will also cover the development of science and technology in India and China, then back to the West. Now, most of the medieval science and technology is largely the story of the preservation, recovery, and modification of earlier achievements. But as we will know later in this lecture, by the end of the period, Western civilization had begun to produce some remarkable scientific and technological innovations that were to be of utmost significance. This map shows the expansion of Islam during the Middle Ages. Islam started to spread widely in the 7th century AD. As the Arabs from Syria and Iraq came to conquer the lands stretching up to the Mediterranean with the message of Islam, they very often found little resistance from the local population. So, very soon, a vast area stretching from Spain to India came under the influence of Islam, and thus extensive trade and cultural exchanges became possible. The flourishing trade gave rise to demand from commodities, and this in turn encouraged invention of new techniques for making steel, making paper, silk, porcelain, and many other products. Now, what was most crucial about the Arab-centered civilization was its willingness to examine and understand the classical, scientific, and philosophical traditions of the Greeks in the context of its new and vigorous culture. This was possible because of the written documents which reached the Arabs with the spread of the Roman Empire. So they traced the store of knowledge back to the original Greek works. So they translated these writings, the Greek writings, studied them, and developed them further. Caliph al-Mamun founded a Bureau of Translation known as the Dar il hikmah where the great scholars Hinwain ibn Ishaq and Thabit ibn Kura prepared Arabic texts out of Aristotle's and Ptolemy's writings and other major Greek classics of science. They also translated the Indian medicinal, surgical, and astronomical texts, which were brought back by merchants, travelers, and scholars. And it is very interesting to note that only the scientific and philosophical books were selected for translation and not history or poetry. Centuries later, when Europe tapped this source of learning, which was preserved in Arabic, they got a lot of scientific and philosophical writings of all the previous civilizations. But the social sciences and humanities were to be discovered by Europe directly from Greek and Latin. Thus, science and humanities entered into the modern tradition by separate channels. And this perhaps explains to some extent the persisting divide between these areas of knowledge. 
Another reason which ensured the growth of Arabic science apart from flourishing trade was the fact that it was practiced in the language used by the kings and slaves alike. So this provided very strong links between the ordinary craftsmen and scholars. The links which never fail to provide a great impetus to the growth of science. The main pillars of Arab science were astronomy and medicine. However, these were united by astrology, which furnished the link between the outer big world of the heavens and the inner small world of men. In this illustration, from a 16th century Ottoman manuscript, an astronomer calculates the position of a star with an armillary sphere and a quadrant. In the succeeding slides, I will briefly describe the significant contributions of Arabs in some areas of science, such as in medicine, optics, chemistry, astronomy, and in mathematics as well. A doctor treats wounds in this 12th century illustration from the Makamat, a collection of is Islamic tales. Now, central to Islamic medicine was the belief in the Quran and Hadiths, which stated that Muslims had a duty to care for the sick, and this was often referred to as medicine of the Prophet. The major contribution of the Islamic age to the history of medicine was the establishment of hospitals paid for by the charitable donations known as zakat tax. And there is evidence that these hospitals were in existence by the 8th century and they were soon widespread across the Islamic world. The earliest documented general hospital was built around about a century, century later in 805 in Baghdad by the vizier to the caliph Harun al-Rashid. Now, this is a 15th century European portrait of Jabir Ibhayan, who is popularly known as the father of Arab chemistry and one of the founders of modern pharmacy. He was known to the Europeans as Jabir. In general, the Arab doctors, perfumers, and metallurgists made their greatest contribution in chemistry. This was mainly due to the fact that Arab scholars unlike their predecessors in, in Greece, never hesitated to take part in laboratory practices in handling drugs, salts, and precious metals. The Arabs continued the Egyptian and Babylonian traditions and learned extensively from the Indian and the Chinese sources. To these, they added their own rich contributions, giving rise to the first statements of scientific chemistry. Arab chemists greatly improved the earlier distillation apparatus and used it for large-scale production of perfume. They also undertook large-scale production of soda, alum, iron sulfate, and other salts, which could be exported and used particularly in textile and industry. And the Arabs also laid the basis for modern chemistry in their investigation of chemical transformation. During the medieval period, scientists in the Islamic world made many contributions to the field of astronomy too. While their work was based on ancient sources from Greece, Iran, and India, they updated methods for measuring and calculating the movement of heavenly bodies. And they continued to develop module, models of the universe and the movements of the planets within it. For example, the first picture is taken from the Timbuktu manuscripts showing both mathematics and astronomy. Muslims made several important improvements to the theory and construction of sundials, which they inherited from their Indian and Greek predecessors. The illustration in the right is from Abu Rayyan al Biruni's astronomical works, which explains the different phases of the moon. 
with respect to the position of the sun. Arabs also carried on the Greek tradition in astronomy. So they translated Ptolemy's Almagest and they continued astronomical observations in spite of occasional religious interference. And although they did not add substantially to the Greek methods, the continuity that they provided was to prove invaluable to the 16th century astronomers. And they also practiced astronomy and they provided the necessary incentive to develop mathematics. In this, the Arabs adopted the Indian system of numbers and they introduced them to, on a larger scale to the extent that warehouse clerks and traders started using them or these numerals to conduct their business. So the Arabs translated Indian works on algebra and trigonometry and they applied them to solve many physical and practical problems. The development of Arab science continued until the 11th century AD. The association of science with kings, wealthy merchants, and nobles, which was initially very fruitful, ultimately proved to be the weakness of Arab culture and science. So the people began to suspect that the learned advisors or the most knowledgeable advisors of the elite were up to no good. And as a result, Arab science got caught off from the people and they became an easy prey to religious fanaticism. But nonetheless, the genius of Arab science provided a crucial link between the rise of modern science and developments in Greece, as well as in India, and to a lesser extent in China in the classical period. Modern science as we know it arose in the 16th century after the Renaissance in Europe. But the Renaissance took up the classical science as it was transmitted by the Arabs and developed it in a revolutionary sense. Thus, the, important, the importance of Arab science in establishing modern science as we know it today is, of course, indispensable. Now let us turn our attention to what was happening in, the, in India in the medieval times. Shown in this slide is Abu Raihan al biruni an Iranian scholar during the Islamic Golden Age. He was also a distinguished historian and he wrote a great deal of information about India. He gave a detailed account of the level of scientific advances and developments in India. According to al biruni Indians had tried to calculate latitudes and longitudes. He also pointed out that the Indian views regarding matter were similar to those of the Greeks. And according to him, the greatest Indian contribution was in the use of the decimal system. The numeral signs that the Indians used were the source of Arabic and the present-day international numerals. al biruni also ex examined Indian science and he also highlighted that very elitist character of Indian science. Unlike Arab science, which was accessible to the common people, Indian science was restricted to a few elites who practiced science only as an intellectual exercise. Now, glimpses of ancient Hindu astronomy were found in the Vedas and the Vedic literature. Vedic seers were well versed in the motion of the sun and the moon, and they had developed a lunisolar calendar to regulate their activities. Further progress in the field of Hindu astronomy is recorded in the Surya Siddhanta, a Sanskrit treatise in Indian astronomy, summarized by Varahamihira in his Pancha Siddhantika, also known as the Five Treatises. These Siddhantas were the result of the great renaissance in Hindu astronomy, which began in the 3rd or in the 4th century AD and continued right up to the 12th century AD. The Aryabhatiya is the earliest preserved work on astronomy written during the 5th century. The Aryabhatiya laid the foundation of a new school of astronomy known as the Aryabhata school. Indians also established observatories where a special type of astrolabe and water clock were set up. They used those instruments for determining the time and determining the latitudes, for working out the calendar, the dates of the eclipses, and for casting horoscopes for astrological purposes. 
Their knowledge in astronomy was also essential for fixing the direction of Mecca in order to properly align the mosques. By the time of Emperor Muhammad Shah in the 18th century, the Indians were able to compile fairly accurate astronomical tables, rectifying the calendar and in making more accurate predictions of eclipses. However, there was hardly any advances over the Greek astronomy, and it is believed that the astrological aspect and preparation of horoscopes were the mystifying distraction in the Indian astronomy. Geography was also another science that had significant improvement. The 19th century Indian geographers improved on Ptolemy's work and depicted the Indian Ocean as an open body of water instead of a landlocked sea as Ptolemy had done. The astrolabes also helped determine more accurate latitudes. And big advances were also made in the field of cartography when in 1647, Sadiq Isfahani prepared an encyclopedic work that contained a world atlas. The maps he prepared, like this one in the slide, were fairly accurate, and he had also indicated the physical features, for example, mountain ranges by wavy lines, and he used various colors to mark rivers and oceans. Indian metallurgists have also made major contributions which deserve their place in the metallurgical history of the world, along with other great civilizations. Based on the archaeological excavations at Zawar area in Rajasthan, Indians knew how to isolate zinc by about the 1st century AD, while the Europeans had learned this process only during the early 19th century AD. The Rasaratnakara a text ascribed to the great Indian scientist Nagarhuna describes this method of production of zinc. India also contributed significantly to the modern metallurgical advances of zinc and high carbon steel and in the development of metallurgical study leading to the Industrial Revolution in Europe. The isolation of zinc was also accompanied by other developments such as the manufacture of brass, an alloy of copper, uh, and zinc. Indian medicine has a long history. Its earliest concepts are set out in the sacred writings called the Vedas. The Vedas are rich in magical practices for the treatment of diseases and in charms for the expulsion of the demons, which were traditionally supposed to cause diseases. The Golden Age of Indian medicine from 800 BC until about 10 hundreds CE was marked especially by the production of the medical treatises known as the Charaka Samhita and Sashruta Samhita, which were attributed respectively to Charaka, who was a physician, and Sashruta, who was a surgeon. However, because Hindus were prohibited by their religion from cutting the dead body, their knowledge of anatomy was very limited. Hindu physicians employed all five senses in diagnosis. For example, hearing was used to distinguish the nature of the breathing and alteration in the voice and the grinding sound produced by the rubbing together of broken ends of bones. However, magical beliefs still persisted until late in the classical period. Indian medicine also used vegetable drugs from indigenous plants and animal remedies such as the milk of various animals. On the whole, the development of science in medieval India was at rather slow pace. One possible factor could be the narrow social base of learning, that is, learning was restricted to a small elite group. This was to some extent due to the absence of printing. Printing was introduced in India by the Portuguese. However, the products of their printing press were not aesthetic enough to be appreciated by the Mughal court and nobility. So the possession of books was a privilege of the rich. Thus, the spread of knowledge was prevented. Medieval India witnessed considerable improvement and changes in the field of technology. 
While these changes were largely a result of diffusion from outside, some technological innovations also originated in India itself. Diffusion from outside suggests readiness and ability to imitate, apply, and extend the use of technological devices. One of the technical devices that were invented or improved in medieval India is gearing. Medieval India used two types of gears, the worm gearing and the pin drum. The gear is to change direction and the speed of motion. Gears were used in sugar milling, in wooden cotton gin, and in India's water lifting mechanism. Its utilization improved the means of irrigation and probably resulted in extension of agriculture in the whole region. Another medieval Indian invention is the belt drive. It is a comparatively simpler device than gearing. It was used for transmission of power and for increasing or decreasing the speed of motion in home sewing machine and in the fan of an automobile engine. The belt drive spinning wheel as depicted in the picture was invented around the first century AD in India. There was also a significant improvement in weaving with the development of the foot-operated hand loom. Shown in the second picture is a traditional hand loom in India. Indians also improved other technology which had been introduced to them. To sum it up, there seems to have been scientific and technological progress in medieval India, but all within the old frame of thought of the Greek society. It's also interesting to talk about the impediments to the growth of science in India. It is important to note of India's social structure, its religious orthodoxy, and the intellectual atmosphere in general. And let us explain how each one of these had left Indian science way behind its contemporaries. First, we have seen that one kind of pressure for advancing knowledge and technology comes from the necessity of satisfying human needs. There's an old saying that necessity is the mother of invention. And it also appears that in spite of periodic wars between the rulers of various regions and states in the country, there was a very considerable stability in Indian society. Population was small and the land was fertile. And even from small land holdings, Indian peasants were able to meet the requirements of subsistence. They could feed and clothe themselves. And although there were poor, poverty and hunger of the kind we see today did not exist. In addition, the whole, the, the whole of, re, of religion, particularly in the rural areas, and the existence of the caste system contributed both to a certain reconciliation with faith and an acceptance of the social hierarchy. So, there existed what can be called a peculiar kind of satisfaction, which did not allow pressures to build up for either enhancing production through technological innovation or to change the society. Now, by the way, a caste is a form of social stratification in which, um, in particular in India, the society was divided into rigid social groups. I think you are familiar with the Divergence series authored by Veronica Roth, which was actually made into a movie. And so in the Divergence series, it was shown there a fictional caste system. So I don't know if you have watched it, but the series had effectively portrayed the, the caste, although of course it's fictional. Now what I'd like to emphasize is that social stability and stagnation can easily go hand in hand. The rich had no need for change, while the poor had no power to bring about change.
At the level of religion, there was coexistence between Islam, the small minority at that time, and Hinduism, which was the vast majority. The religious leaders of the two communities were well off and they were already satisfied with their economic condition. So within the two religious systems, there were no strong movements of reform. In medieval India, education was also limited to religious teaching and the intellectual atmosphere was not in favor of challenging the established ways of thinking or of propounding new theories. The reign of the orthodoxy with its belief in eternal or revealed truths never allowed free thinking and imaginative adventure of ideas. To put it in another way, the educated had fixed ideas which they did not intend to change, and those whose social status was low and who were exploited by the feudal order had no access to learning. Now let's consider the development of science and technology in China. The history of science and technology in China is both long and rich with science and technological contribution. Let's take a brief look into the early scientific and technological achievements of the Chinese before we discuss how it flourished during the Middle Ages. Science in China has a long history and developed quite independently of Western science. In fact, the Chinese contribution to Western science is particularly interesting because it serves as a center of controversy about the roots of Western science. According to traditional Western scientists, the roots of science and the scientific method is in Greece and Greek thought. There is a tendency among scientists to claim that not only modern science, but science in general, was characteristic of European thought. And they argue that all scientific contributions from non-European civilizations were technology-based and not science-based. In fact, there have been many Western innovations that have their basis in China, particularly those in printing the paper printing, block printing, and the movable type printing. Also, with agricultural technology, like the irrigation systems, in mechanical engineering, like the clockwork, iron, and lead manufacturing, efficient harnesses, and even in Marshall, we have the gunpowder, which was the precursors to the barrel gun and cannons, to the, those technology. But in antiquity, Independent of Greek philosophers and other civilizations, ancient Chinese philosophers made significant advances in science and technology. So in the succeeding slides, we will discuss the key contributions of China to the history of science and technology. Now the four great inventions of China are the compass, gunpowder, paper making, and printing. And these were among the most important technological advances only known in Europe by the end of the Middle Ages. One of the oldest long-standing contributions of the ancient Chinese are in traditional Chinese medicine, including acupuncture and herbal medicine, derived from the Taoist philosophy. According to archaeological findings, the first writings on medicine appeared between the 11th and the 3rd centuries BCE. The practice of acupuncture can be traced as far back as the 1st millennium BCE, and some scientists believe that there is evidence that practices similar to acupuncture were also used in Eurasia during the early Bronze Age. So China's four great inventions that have the greatest global significance, as I have mentioned, are the compass, gunpowder, paper making, and printing. China was the first nation to invent paper. Before its invention, words were written on various natural materials by ancient peoples, like on grass stalks by the Egyptians, on earthen plates by the Mesopotamians, on tree leaves by the Indians, on ship skin by the Europeans, and of course, strangest of all, even inscribed on bamboo or wooden strips 
tortoise shells or shoulder blades of an ox by the early Chinese. Now later, inspired by the process of silk reeling, the people in ancient China succeeded in first making a kind of paper called bo, which was made out of silk. But its production was very expensive due to the scarcity of materials. In the early days of the second century, a court official named Kai Lun produced a new kind of paper from bark, rags, wheat stalks, and other materials. It was relatively cheap, light, thin, durable, and more suitable for brush writing. Originally, paper was rough. But eventually, over time, the making of paper was improved with sizing, dyes, and the use of molds made out of bamboo strips. Paper was, use, was first used, of course, by the Chinese for wrapping. And it was not until the 3rd century that paper replaced bamboo, silk, and wood as a writing medium. China's civil service officials needed lots of paper to do their work, so paper gradually became mass-produced in government factories. But writing was not the only use for paper. The Chinese began using paper made from rice straw for toilet purposes in the 6th century AD. Also, the Chinese began to have a paper currency in the early 9th century. At the beginning of the 3rd century, the paper-making process first spread to Korea and then to Japan. It reached the Arab um, in the Tang Dynasty and Europe in the 12th century. In the 16th century, it also went to America by way of Europe and then gradually spread all over the world. Another technology developed in China was printing. The Chinese began to use woodblock printing in the 7th century, where the text is carved into the woodblocks, which are then inked. A blank sheet of paper is placed over the ink block so that the image can be transferred to the paper. Printed in Tang Dynasty, a Buddhist sutra is the first book in the world with a verifiable date of printing. Now, before the invention of printing, Dissemination of knowledge depended either on word of mouth or handwritten copies of manuscripts. So both took time and were liable to error. So beginning 2,000 years ago in the Western Han Dynasty, stone tablet rubbing was used for spreading Confucian classics or Buddhist sutras. This led the Sui Dynasty to practice engraving of writing or pictures on a wooden board smearing it with ink, and then printing on pieces of paper page by page. And this became known as block printing. The first book with a verifiable date of printing appeared in China in the year 868, or nearly 600 years before that happened in Europe. During the Tang Dynasty, this technology was gradually introduced to Korea, to Japan, Vietnam, and in the Philippines as well. Yet, block printing had its drawbacks. All the boards became useless after the printing was done, and a single mistake in carving could ruin a whole block. So during the Song Dynasty, a man named Bi Sheng carved individual characters on identical pieces of fine clay, which he hardened by a slow baking process, resulting in pieces of movable type. When the printing was finished, the pieces of of blocks were put away for future use. And this technology then spread to Korea, Japan, Vietnam, and Europe. And later, Johann Gothenburg, a German, invented the movable type of blocks made of metal in the year 1440. There is no doubt that the Chinese invented gunpowder. Chinese Taoist alchemists were the major force behind the early invention of gunpowder. Emperor Wu Di of the Han Dynasty financed the research done by the alchemists on the secrets of eternal life. So the alchemists experimented with sulfur and potassium nitrate. They heated the substances in order to transform them. In the Tang Dynasty during the 8th century, Sulfur and saltpeter were first combined with charcoal in order to create an explosive that they called huyao or gunpowder. 
The gunpowder was then used to treat skin diseases and is a fumigant to kill insects even before its advantage as a weapon was made clear. The Chinese then experimented with the gunpowder-filled tubes, and at some point, they attached bamboo tubes to arrows and launched them with bows. Soon, they discovered that these gunpowder tubes could launch themselves just by the power produced from the escaping gas. So, a true rocket was born. Gunpowder was originally used for making fireworks, and its later adaptation revolutionized warfare across the world. And they also used it in cannons, in bombs, and grenades even before the 11th century. The ability to magnetize iron by placing it near a lodestone was known to ancient civilizations. But it was the Chinese who applied this principle of magnetism to create the compass. The oldest picture of a magnetic compass from 200 BC was using a small spoon as the needle that was thrown down upon a table that was engraved with the compass points. These early compasses were used in divination rather than in navigation, so the board was used by what they call as the geomancers in order to detect the winds and waters of the earth. In the Han Dynasty, the earliest Chinese compasses were called the South Pointer because it pointed south rather than north. After constant improvement, the round compass came into being. In the Song Dynasty, a new kind of compass appeared, made by the method of artificially induced magnetism, and it was widely used in seafaring. Chinese sailors used the compass for navigation by the 11th century, and by the 12th century, through 15th century, China developed the largest navy and was the greatest sea power in the world. And it is obvious that the compass greatly assisted in their navigation. China was also the first country in the world to raise silkworms and make silk, the practice known as sericulture. In the 16th century BC, during the Shang Dynasty, Woven pattern technology and braid embroidery appeared. After the 2nd century BC, with the invention of the reeling car, the spinning wheel, and the oblique loom, textile technology and embroidery evolved rapidly. People at that time could not only weave, but they could also create wonderful embroidery, which made China renowned all over the world as the oriental country of silk. The Chinese approach the natural world through philosophical schools of thought. Another approach through the organization of plants, animals, and minerals into their uses by mankind in the form of books called Benkao, which was often translated as pharmacopoeia. The Benkao are texts that include natural history, biological classifications, and practical and medical uses of natural materials. In modern terms, biology, geology, and medicine. By the Ming Dynasty, great comprehensive Benkao texts had been compiled that are still used in China today. For example, is the Benkao Gangmu by Li Shi Zhen. China is one of the first countries in the world to have done astronomical research. Documents indicate that astronomical observations date as far back as some 4,000 years ago during the time of the legendary Emperor Yao. There are written documents dating from the 16th century BC about sunspots, comets, meteors, novas, the sun, the moon, and five of the planets, as well as star catalogs, star charts, etc. In the fields of astronomical theory and instruments, the ancient Chinese established the famous theory of cosmography and invented such brilliant astronomical instruments as the armillary sphere, which is a model of the, of the objects in the sky. Now shown in the photos are the armillary as de depicted in ancient Chinese texts.
One question that has been the subject of debate among historians has been why China did not develop a scientific revolution and why Chinese technology fell behind that of Europe. Many hypotheses have been proposed ranging from the cultural to the political and economic. Sinologist Nathan Sivan has argued that China indeed had a scientific revolution in the 17th century and that we are still far from understanding the scientific revolutions of the West and China in all their political, economic, and social ramifications. John K. Fairbank argued that the Chinese political system was hostile to scientific progress. Joseph Needham also argued, and most scholars agreed, that cultural factors prevented these Chinese achievements from developing into what co could be called science. So it was the religious and philosophical framework of the Chinese intellectuals which made them unable to believe in the ideas of loss of nature. Now let's discuss the emergence of scientific thinking and methodology in Europe. As Roman imperial power effectively ended in the West during the 5th century, Western Europe entered the Middle Ages with great difficulties that affected the, con the continent's intellectual production dramatically. In Europe, during the first centuries of the Middle Ages, scholars who were recruited from the clergy concentrated their intellectual activities mainly on religion. They used their rigors of scientific investigation for practical purposes that were mainly for the sake of their religion. For example, it was important for the Catholic Church to determine the date for Easter, which would not have been possible without some knowledge of the motions of the moon and the sun, or some ba basic mathematics. Their medical and botanical knowledge was also used for the church's duty to help and tend the sick. Scientific issues were hardly ever discussed in depth by the intellectual elite, so the world, they claimed, would be improved by God's will if he thought it necessary. Beginning around the year 1050, European scholars built upon their existing knowledge by seeking out ancient learning in Greek and Arabic texts which they translated into Latin. This period also saw the birth of medieval universities, which benefited materially from the translated texts and provided a new infrastructure for scientific communities. The rediscovery of the works of Aristotle allowed the full development of the new Christian philosophy and the method of scholasticism. Scholastics believed in empiricism and they supported Roman Catholic doctrines through secular study, reason, and logic. By 1200, there were reasonably accurate Latin translations of the main works of Aristotle, Euclid, Ptolemy, Archimedes, and Galen. During the 13th century, scholastics expanded the natural philosophy of these texts by commentaries, which are also associated with teaching in the universities, and as well as independent treatises. Notable among these were the works of Roger Bacon. Roger Bacon described a repeating cycle of observation, hypothesis, experimentation, and the need for independent verification. He recorded the manner in which he conducted his experiments in precise detail so that others could reproduce and independently test his results. And this was the cornerstone of the scientific method. In his book entitled Opus Meus, he expounds on scientific and mathematical matters. Bacon was convinced that no true knowledge could be arrived without an empirical basis. To his mind, scientia experimentalis, science based upon empirical methods and the possibility of objective verification are the only true science. So he believed that 
theoretical speculation or assumption would only lead away from truth. After the renaissance of the 12th century, medieval Europe saw a radical change in the rate of new inventions, innovations in the ways of managing traditional means of production and in their economic growth. The period saw major technological advances, including the adoption of gunpowder, the invention of vertical windmills, spectacles, mechanical clocks, and greatly improved water mills, and as well as building techniques, and in agriculture as well. European technical advancements from the 12th century to 14th centuries were either built on long-established techniques in medieval Europe originating from the Roman and the Byzantine antecedents, or either adopted from cross-cultural exchanges through trading networks with the Islamic world or with China and India. Often, the revolutionary aspect lay not in the act of invention itself, but in its technological refinement and application to political and economic power. For example, though gunpowder and other weapons had been started by the Chinese, it was the Re Europeans who developed and perfected its military potential, precipitating European expansion and eventual imperialism in the modern era. Also, significant in this respect were advances in maritime technology, such as in shipbuilding and navigation, which allowed economic and military control of the seas adjacent to Europe and enabled the global navigational achievements of the dawning age of exploration. At the turn of the Renaissance, Gothenburg's invention of mechanical printing made possible a dissemination of knowledge to a wider population that would lead to not only gradually more egalitarian society, but one more able to dominate other cultures drawing from a vast reserve of knowledge and experience. So people of the Middle Ages had to face a great number of questions and pressing problems. More and more, they were willing to answer or, or solve them with the help of methods and knowledge which were defined and acquired in their own times. Some of the inventions and discoveries made in the Middle Ages, for example, the invention of gunpowder, led to problems which ask for immediate reaction in a variety of fields. Innovation came from political leaders, for example, men of the church, merchants, navigators, soldiers, artists, and architects. So in order to find solutions, more and more intellectuals dared to study nature objectively and to apply the results of contemporary scientific thinking. So this led to an enormous increase in the quantity and quality of innovation and eventually resulted in the scientific revolution of the 16th and 17th century.